What's up, y'all, and welcome into the Jack Vita Show. I'm your host, as always, Jack Vita. We are back in action here on October 21st, 2021, smack dab in the middle of the ALCS and the NLCS. We're talking plenty of baseball today. Uh, if you guys missed our last episode for baseball, talked with Arrestus Estrade and Albert Estrade to preview these championship series. Next week, we'll be previewing the World Series, and we'll also have a lot of football content coming out. So make sure you guys are all subscribed to the Jack Vita Show on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever it is that you are getting your podcast. We're live right now on Twitter, and I don't want to waste any more time because we have a fantastic guest joining us on the program today. So uh, this guy, he played he's, he played uh, about, what, 12 years Major League Baseball? How many 11 years? plus, yep. 11 plus. Okay, so... He was on the Phillies 1993 team, went to the World Series, came on over to Chicago, played on the Cubs for a couple of years uh, where he had one of his best years. Cubs made the playoffs in 98. He had a front row seat for the uh, that summer, the home run chase with Sosa and McGuire here in the NL Central. Uh, so he's a, a fountain of baseball wisdom. He also played at Indiana University uh, back when Indiana basketball was amazing. Yeah. It, <laughs> and he's also a fellow Steelers fan, but best of all, he is the father of frequent <laughs> contributor to the podcast, Jordan Morandini. We welcome Mickey Morandini. Welcome to the show. Thanks, Jack. Uh, awesome to be here. First time I've been on the show. It's been how many years? I know, right? <laughs> I didn't want to buy. I, didn't, I wanted to. We're starting to get all the bigger guests rolling them out now. So I started with Jordan, and now I've upgraded. So yeah, I, I don't well, know if Jordan's going to be. Jordan might back. not think that, but. Uh, it's good to be on. And of course, uh, yeah, for those who don't know who are listening, I went to Valparaiso University with two of Mickey's sons, Jordan and Griffin. And I got to say, Mick, you guys did a great job raising Jordan. Yeah, he's a good kid. He's, uh, you know, he's got his head on straight and uh, uh, he's living there in Indianapolis now with, with Griffin, actually. So, uh, yeah, he uh, he turned out all right. Yeah, and once again, you guys did a good job raising Jordan. Thanks. No comment on Griffin. No, I'm just kidding. I love Griffin. He's oh, Griff's guy. awesome. Griff's two different guy. kids, two completely different kids. <laughs> Jordan's a straight and narrow, and Griffin's kind of on the wild side and <laughs> likes to have fun, but they're both good kids. They're great kids. No, I was I love to since I'm Jordan and I are the same age. We're both were born in '94, uh, the year of the lot of the strike where there's no season. We'll talk about that later, but Griffin being a couple years younger than us, he's always he. I think of him a little bit like one of my little brothers. I like to yeah. uh, always poke him a little bit. So, oh, yeah, yeah. chance there. <laughs> it's fun to poke at Griff, that's for sure. And yeah, of course, we met. The only time I think I saw you was when we went to the. It was a White Sox. You guys were playing the White Sox, and it was when you were doing the first base job, okay. first base coach job with the Phillies in 2016. You did it again in 17. Yeah. Um and. I remember we got to park in the player's parking lot and I had never done that before. So I was just like, <laughs> this is so cool. This is really fun. Yeah. There's some perks to coaching and um, yeah, that's one of them. You get to uh, leave, uh, you know, tickets and parking passes usually for the people you want to come. So yeah, that's pretty cool. Yeah. It was a good time. So Mick, I know you're a fellow Steelers fan before we dive into baseball. I mean, is this just the end of Big Ben? I'm also a huge Steelers fan, and I'm watching this game on Sunday night. I'm watching – we're playing Seattle at home on a primetime game. They're without their starting quarterback and their starting running back. Why on earth is this game going to overtime? Is this the end? Well, you know, they had a really good first half. The defense was dominating, and they were moving the ball pretty good. And I don't know – I don't know if they didn't make any adjustments at halftime, but Seattle comes out and just really ran the ball down their throats, which was really surprising to me because the Steelers always have had a good run defense. And um, it really changed the, the outcome of the game there. And they just kept running it down our throats. And, you know, the issue, you know, this offense, it, it should be better than it is. They have some really good young uh, weapons on the outside and, and the running back is going to be really good. I mean, I really like this kid Harris. So, um, but for, for Ben, for me, it's just, he's so immobile now. I mean, he, he can't move at all. And I know he's got some injury issues, I think with a hip and stuff, but, uh, it's just, uh, I'm, I'm kind of tired of the short passing game. I'd like oh, to see yeah. him throw the ball down the field a little more because they got these speedy weapons out there, but, um, you know, 
they're they're that middle tier for me right now, and um, I, definitely the Ravens are a, a notch better. And right now the Bengals are looking pretty good. So and the, obviously the Browns are beat up right now, but uh, it's no longer a, a Steelers division. You, you know, we always used to sit on top, and everybody's kind of caught up to us. So. Um, I'm a little surprised that they have not gone out and got a backup for him in the last couple of drafts. That really surprised me because it's one of the most, as you know, well-run organizations, you know, for a long, long time. Um, so I'm a little uh, disappointed in that, but they must have a plan. So we'll see what happens at the end of the year. Yeah, I think it is time to bring someone in. It's not Dwayne Haskins. I don't no. think Rudolph's a starter. Right. Rudolph's probably a career backup and he'll probably have a good career as a backup, but I think they're, they're going to need a legitimate franchise quarterback. And so I've been, this is the year, like typically in the past, I haven't really looked ahead at drafts. Like the Steelers have had three top 10 picks over the last 30 years. So the NFL draft, I never care about it, but now I'm like, I'm actually like, Oh, Steelers got to draft a quarterback soon. So I've been watching, I mean, I'm a huge college football fan. I already watch a ton But I'm kind of this next draft isn't really a deep quarterback draft. And CBS Sports just put out their latest mock draft. They only had two quarterbacks in the first round, none in the top 10. Now, I think that'll probably change because teams are going to want a quarterback. Someone will trade up and they'll overvalue guys. Um, But really, the two guys right now that are on the radar are uh, the one guy that I really think they could get is Carson Strong from Nevada. So if you get a chance to watch some Mountain West games late on a Saturday night or late in the afternoon on Saturdays, that guy's got a big arm. He's probably going to be like a Zach Wilson or a Josh Allen guy who's going to move up the board. Uh, and People don't know a lot about him. And then uh, the other one is Matt Corral, and Matt Corral is probably going to go off the board earlier. But I'm also looking, I'm like, the Steelers, if, if no one's drafting quarterbacks in the top 10, Steelers are probably going to be smack dab in the middle once again, like around pick 15, pick 16. So this feels like the type of year where you go and get a quarterback. And if you don't draft them, I know some people are talking about, well, maybe they could trade for, there was a, yesterday, there was some news about Tua Tonga-Vailoa potentially being traded from Miami. And I don't think that trade ended up getting done. And maybe it's still a work in progress. Maybe it will happen. I could be wrong on that. But a guy like a Tua or Jordan Love, it, potentially someone the Steelers could trade for. I would much rather draft my own quarterback because then you got the guy for five years of control rather than. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I'm not, I don't follow a lot of college football, I'll be honest with you. So I don't know what quarterbacks are out there, but uh, I don't even know if we have, we've kind of traded our high draft picks, you know, the last few years. Yeah. Make uh, a Fitzpatrick trade. We have a high enough draft pick to, to trade for a, a good quarterback. So, um, but they're, they're going to have to bring somebody in. I, I think this is it for Ben. I can't yeah. see him playing beyond this year. So um, if they're banking on one of these two backups that they have, I think they're going to be in some trouble. It reminds me of the final year that Peyton Manning had with Denver. And that team won the Super Bowl, and they had a great defense. And the Steelers have a great defense. Yeah. But to tell the truth, the league's changed so much over the last six years. I don't think you can win a Super Bowl with just a great defense anymore. No, I don't think so. It's a, it's a quarterback driven league, obviously. And um, I, I was happy they drafted this running back. Uh, like I said, he's, he's a stud man and you can give him the ball 25, 30 times a game. And it doesn't seem to affect him. He gets kind of stronger as the game goes on. So um, if we can get a quarterback in here, maybe a mobile quarterback, that seems to be the big thing in the NFL now is a quarterback that can throw and run. Um, I think that would be a perfect fit for this offense with with the guys they have on the outside and and the and the defense. I think I think the defense is going to continue to get better. They're still yeah. pretty young and uh, they've done a really good job here. So um, yeah, we're going to have to make a, a decision here on Big Ben uh, uh, sometime soon. Yes, we will. And just like that, we move over to the ALCS, the NLCS. Right now, today's Thursday. The Astros took a three to two lead. Uh, last night with their win in Boston. It looks like I think that series is done. We're going back to Houston for the next two games. It feels I, – I, I just do not believe the Red Sox are going to go out to Houston and win the next two games. But I could be wrong. We'll see. Yeah, I agree with you. Um, you know, Boston uh, blew a big chance here. I mean, home home field, You're you know, I think the, they were up two to one. Um, they just haven't pitched well the last couple of games. And uh, – 
you know, Houston's got a great offense. Hopefully they're not, uh, you know, banging the, banging the drums in, in the dugout. <laughs> but, uh, uh, yeah, I think, I think I'm going to be honest. I think both series are over to be honest with you, but, mm. uh, yeah, Houston's got a good club and, um, uh, they got a great pitching performance last night, which they haven't had. So uh, the momentum's definitely on their side right now. Yeah, I to tell the truth, I haven't had too much interest in the AL series because I looked at it. I was like, you know, I, I didn't believe in Boston because I didn't think their pitching was good enough. And also, I thought that I'm just looking at this and being fully transparent. It's like, well, you got the Astros who disgraced the game a few years ago, and they're playing a team who's managed by one of the guys who led that whole thing in Alex Cora. And right. then the Red Sox had their whole Apple watch thing. And so it's kind of like, I, I, I don't know. I, there's not really, I mean, I try to be impartial, but I, I just look at that and it's like, if the Rays or the White Sox are one of these teams, even if it was the Blue Jays or heck, even the Yankees, like I, I think I would have a little more excitement with this series, but there's something about it that just kind of rubs me the wrong way watching some of the, some of the parties involved in the series. Yeah, I'm with you. I'm not a Red Sox or a, a, a Houston fan at all. Um, I was really surprised that the that Boston uh, took it to Tampa as easy as they did. I was kind of rooting for Tampa just because kind of kind of the underdog. They don't have a big payroll and um, they don't have any superstars, but they they play the game the right way and they've always been they've always pitched well and find ways to score runs. They play good defense and. Um, so I was a little uh, disappointed that they didn't move on further. But, yeah, I'm, I'm right there with you. I'm not uh, into either of these two American League teams. <laughs> well, the NLCS, which now right now, the Braves are up 3-1. to one, uh, And this is honestly quite shocking. I don't think anyone had the Braves going up 3-1. to one. I thought the Braves could make this a good competitive series. They're up 3-1. to one. We got game five today. It's in L.A., and then we're going to go back to Atlanta for the game six and game seven. If we get there, like you said, it feels like this one's over. I, I will say I, I can't count out the Dodgers until I actually see them dead. Because last year, the Braves were up 3-1. Now, granted, last year was extremely different. There wasn't any, there was no home field. It was such a weird playoff situation. They just played on consecutive days. But. The Braves are just, they're clicking at the right time. And I think this is what happens in the sport sometimes. It's like, you just got to be playing baseball, your best baseball at the right time, and you can go on a run. And that's what we're seeing with the Braves. Yeah, that's exactly right. They're Of all the four teams that are still alive, they're playing the best baseball of anybody. Um, it's really surprised me how well they've hit the ball against this Dodgers pitching staff. I mean, they're scoring some runs and and uh, putting some big numbers up there, which really surprised me with Scherzer going and Urias going and uh, Bueller. I mean, those are three really Cy Young type pitchers. So um, I'm with you. I, 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 the Dodgers are very experienced, obviously. They've been to the World Series the last few years. You can't count them out. But just, you know, they're lucky to be, even be alive right now. If it wasn't for a home run late uh, um, on, on, you know, in game three, the series would be over. I just think the Braves are dominating this series so much. I just can't see the, the Dodgers winning three straight. Can't see it. I've been extremely impressed with Jock Peterson this year uh, in the postseason this October, or as he's calling it, Jocktober. And <laughs> Jock, I think it's, it's a cool story because he spent the first seven years of his career with this Dodgers organization, and he never got – much of an opportunity to be more than a platoon player because the Dodgers are so deep and that's how they win and that's how they do things. And he wanted to go out and be an everyday player. He came over to Chicago, didn't really work out too well here in Chicago. Now, granted, the team was going to blow up at any point. They're going to blow the whole team up and sell. Uh, we knew that. I mean, a, a good number of us knew this at, at the start of the season. Not everyone wanted to believe it, but many of us saw it coming. He didn't play well in Chicago, but he's been like, I think the thing with Jock Peterson is his confidence or some may even say overconfidence. It plays so well in his favor this time of year because he's not phased by the big moments. And he's already he's been here for the last seven years. Like he's so he doesn't look like he looks so comfortable every time he steps up to bat in these games, even though he's facing his former team. 
Yeah, he's got an aura about him that uh, he's definitely got a lot of confidence, that's for sure. But, uh, yeah, I mean, he's got the experience. He's been in all these big games the last few years. So, you know, being in this this situation now, it's not going to phase him. But that's got to be pretty exciting to have a team trade you and then you have the chance to come back and say, you know, hey, uh, uh, you're going to be sorry that you did that. And he's, he's obviously, you know, with the pinch hit home runs and the way he's playing – and the, and the Braves did a great job at the trade deadline. Um, you know, they lose Acuna and everybody's like, they're done. And they go out and make a couple of big trades. And these guys are, are stepping up for them and they're playing really good baseball. And uh, the pitching staff has always been good there. And they're getting good bullpen work for the most part. So, uh, yeah, like you said, they're peaking at the right time. And I remember back in 2011, I think it was, with the Phillies, we had the best team in baseball, hands down, with the pitching staff we had. And we had all these superstars with Rollins and Utley and Howard. And the Cardinals came in hot. And um, they ended up beating us with a Carpenter shutout in game five that, that knocked us out of the playoffs. So, uh, you know, you can throw all the the regular season records out when, when the playoffs start. And uh, as you said, it's the team that's playing the best baseball at that time. And right now it's the Braves. And that's why I think it would be, and feel free to disagree with me, I think it'd be a joke if they expand this postseason because it sounds like Major League Baseball wants to do that. We saw that report floated out there before last season, before COVID and everything that they were talking about. Ooh, it'd be nice to get two more teams in each league getting into the playoffs. And then last year they kind of got to experiment with their big format for the COVID year, which, you know, whatever, is a COVID year, but when ESPN signed their extension with Major League Baseball, they're hoping to get more playoff games. My hope is that what they that means is you turn the wild card into a best of three series. I think, though, it would be horrible for the sport. and It wouldn't be good if all of a sudden now we're devaluing the regular season and we're just going to let everyone into the playoffs. And now do you really want to see like a, a 76 win Mets team just getting hot at the right time and winning the world series? Yeah, I, I wouldn't, I, I'm with you. I don't want to expand anymore. I mean, the great thing about baseball has always been, you have four to five, six teams getting in. Uh, they all earn it. Um, I kind of like that one, one game wild card playoff. I, yeah. I, no, I, I kind of like that because uh, you know, why should a wild card, two wild card teams get a chance to play a five game series? Um, so I like that little one game playoff there. And uh, usually the, 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 you know, you got to, you got to throw your best pitcher. So when you go into a series, if you win it, you, you know, you don't have your, your best guy starting off the series in game one, but uh, I think the numbers are great right now, but you know, it's all about money now and all the sports and they're going to try and do whatever they can to, to get more income for these owners and, um, the TV revenue is off the charts now. So um, I wish they would just uh, keep it as it is. Now, I do, and I don't know if we'll get into it, but I would like some rules changes. Oh, um, But uh, uh, that's that's for another topic. But uh, <laughs> I think it's I think it's good. Right? I mean, we already have the playoffs going. I think the last game of the World Series is going to be like November 7th or something, which is late. I mean, you get playing in Boston or New York or – you know, Chicago, Minnesota, those cities, November 7th, my God, it could be snowing. So um, if you're going to add playoff games, you might want to think about, you know, dropping a dozen or so regular season games so you can still, you know, get these games in where the weather has a chance to be decent. Yeah, would you mind if they, I mean, for, I, I can't remember what year it was. I I don't, Honestly, I, I do not know. But for decades and decades, they played 154 games. It's not like we have to be married to 162. Right. Like with this and even like NFL expanded and NFL had been 14 games before. It's not like this tradition of 162 is so important. I wouldn't mind if they went to 154. And what I'd like to see then is I'd expand the uh, the DS to a seven game series. Right. Yeah, I mean, uh, you know, once again, it's going to come down to money. Do those owners want to give up four home games during the year, which, you know, turns out to be probably quite quite a bit of money yeah. for these owners. But um, I, I think at some point we might get to that. I do know, like you said, they want to expand two more teams. 
Um, I think Nashville's looking for a team. Montreal wants a team back. I think Portland's interested in getting a baseball team. And, and to be honest with you, we need to get Tampa out of Tampa. It, it's not good there right now. And we probably need to get Oakland out of Oakland um, and get them maybe in Vegas. Well, how about what if we get Tampa in Tampa? We get them out of St. Pete. Do you think that could work better? Well, they've been trying to do that. They've been trying to get a stadium built in downtown Tampa somewhere, kind of where the ba- uh, football uh, you know, football stadium is, I, I think it would help some because you're right in St. Petersburg, if you live North of Tampa, it's a haul to get to a game and nobody wants to do that. But just in general, I don't think baseball does well in Florida, you know, cause you have all these people moving from other parts of the country and they're not interested in baseball down there. They're going down there to retire and <laughs> play golf and enjoy the weather. And, um, so you don't have any those true in-state people that are that interested in baseball. And um, I just – even the Marlin, Marlins don't draw worth a crap, and they're right down in the middle of the city. Um, so um, I just don't think baseball is a chance to do very well down there. Yeah, I think it, I think it can. I'd like to see the version of it where they put – they build a cool stadium because the trop is just – crapped on oh yeah dump. it's the worst ballpark in major leagues absolutely yeah and then like you said you talk about oakland i think they're probably going to move out of oakland and yeah. for a while i thought they'd go to san jose or another suburb but with vegas really opening up and there's a lot of money if you build a team if you move your team to vegas sure. and build a stadium there yeah. I, I feel like if i had to predict what's going to happen with those teams i think tampa is going to end up getting a publicly funded stadium. Uh, I think that's kind of what this Montreal stuff is, is they're going to use some leverage to yeah. get put pressure on the city, build a new park in downtown Tampa, make it a cool one. And then I think, so I think that'll probably happen with the Rays. And I think with the A's, like they're going to move to Vegas. If I had to, if I had to predict right now. Yeah, I agree with you. I, I yeah, I, I mean, uh, we'll see with Tampa. Um, I know they're talking about splitting home games in Montreal and Tampa. I don't think that's the wise thing to do. No. But, uh, yeah, it looks like right now Oakland has a pretty good chance to, to go to Vegas. So um, we'll see what happens. You, you just never know with the way uh, the game is, is going right now. Well, I wouldn't mind in terms of expansion if they were to expand and add two more franchises and get a nice round number like they have in the NFL, 32, 16 in each league, four divisions. They could do some kind of a realignment type thing. I wouldn't mind that, but I don't think we should add postseason teams until we get there. We should add yeah. two more teams. And then once you, when you get to 32, you don't need to add any more teams to sport. Yeah, I'm not a big fan of expansion, to be honest with you. Just, the, the league is so watered down now. We have so many players in the big leagues that really don't deserve to be in the big leagues. And now you're going to add, you know, 50-some more roster spots. It's going to water this league down more. But That's fair. Um, uh, I'm with you. I don't know. Maybe we should just have one American League, one National League. You take the top five teams in the National League, you take the top five teams in the American League, and and you send them to the playoffs and, and see who the best team is. But, um, you know, this commissioner's done some crazy things. He's made some crazy rules changes. Um, we'll see what he does. We'll see if he, he can improve this game. Because right now I'm not sure the game is a lot better today than it was, you know, 15, 20 years ago. Yeah, it's definitely changed a lot from when you played back in the 90s, ending in the early 2000s. What are the biggest differences and things, ways that it's changed for the worse? Well, the analytics for me has really hurt the game. Now, I, you know, all the new school people are going to say I'm crazy, but, um, you know, with the shifts and the and the uh, relievers, you know, reliever games now, bullpen games, and, you know, the replay, um, and the, you know, the seven inning games, and the three batter minimum for the relievers, all those things I I don't like. I don't, sorry about that. I don't (laughs) like. So, um, you know, I'm, I'm old school, and you've probably talked to a lot of new school and old school guys, but baseball to me is manufacturing runs and having pitchers that throw strikes and can command the baseball. It's not about how hard a guy throws. 
um, you know, moving a runner, scoring a runner on a ground ball, stealing a base, hit and run, bun a guy, things like that. That's baseball to me. And you're just not seeing that now. You see a strikeout, you see a walk, you see a home run, you see the same thing over and over again. And I, for me, the game's a little bit boring right now. And um, they're long games because pitchers don't know how to throw strikes. Every batter's 3-2. Um, you know, you don't have the Greg Maddoxes that can pinpoint command and get first pitch outs and uh, things like that. So um, I, I do know they're good. I think they're going to get away with the seven inning do double headers. They're going to go back to nine innings. Yeah. I think they're going to bring the DH into the National League, which is fine. Um, we'll see what they do with the shift. Um, but uh, some of these things I hope go away so we can get back to what I consider normal baseball. Well, what if a small market team, these these small market teams that are like, for instance, the Oakland A's and Moneyball, they went, they were a, ahead of the curve on on base percentage, for example. What if there's a small market team that says, well, everyone's devaluing batting average right now and contact hitting. Right. What if what if a team puts a, a roster together, wins with it without a whole lot of money, and it's like wow, this is the return of small ball. This is a return of contact hitting, good defense, classic um, old school baseball. Could that, I mean, could we see a team, one, take that approach and then see the rest of the league start to follow suit? I hope so. I hope so. Um, I think two, three, four years ago, nobody cared if they struck out. And I think that's starting to change. I think yeah. – I think the organization is starting to realize, man, we got to start putting the ball in play more. So I think that's starting to turn a little bit. Um, but you still, you know, teams don't bunt. Um, they don't hit and run. Uh, they don't uh, suicide squeeze. They don't really care about moving runners. Um, it still is the three-run home run. That's what, what these teams are trying to do, hit three-run home runs. And um, you, you know, the strikeouts are at all time high, the batting average is at all time low. Um, and that's that creates a boring baseball game to me. So, as you said, we need to get back to putting the ball in play, manufacturing runs, having pitchers command the baseball, not just throw 98 miles per hour. Um, and and but you're yeah, I think if a couple teams go out and do that, I think we're slowly starting yeah. to see that a little bit. Uh, maybe we can get back to uh, a little more baseball um, and a little less analytics. <laughs> I mean, I think that – I do think that that's going to happen. Now, it's not going to look the same as it once was. I don't know if we're ever going to say the way the game was 30 years ago, it's right. ever going to be like that again. But I do think we're going through a cycle. These things can happen in cycles. And I think we're going to see eventually some team is going to win with a contact hitting approach. And then I think some teams are going to follow suit. Yeah, I mean, I don't know what year it was when Kansas City won the titles. Probably 2015. Six or seven years ago or something. And they they struck out the least amount in baseball. And, and all of a sudden, you know, a few years later, nobody cares if everybody's striking out. So I know as a, as a player, I played for 11 years. When I struck out, I was embarrassed. I hate – I was embarrassed to walk back to the dugout. I didn't like to strike out. Um, I don't know if, obviously, the players really care about it um, these days. But uh, I think eventually – and it's, it's not going to happen overnight. It's going to take some time. But I think eventually we're going to get back to making more contact – Pitchers have a little more command on the mound. Uh, hopefully it's sooner than later. So you mentioned the designated hitter coming to the National League most likely. It dawned on me the other day that this series, Braves and Dodgers, this is the last true National League series we're ever going to see most likely. And you know what? I know it's it was bound to happen eventually, and there's really nothing we can do about it. But – I do. I've always preferred National League Baseball, and I'm going to miss it. I agree. I love the the you know the managers have to manage in the National League. They have to decide: yeah. are we pinch hitting here? Are we taking this pitcher out? Are we double switching? Um, and obviously, with the DH, you don't have to make those decisions. You either take the pitcher out or you don't. There's you know it it you know the bench isn't quite as important when you have a DH. Um, but, uh, 
you know, the pitchers are so unskilled now with the bat. I mean, they don't bunt anymore very good. They don't put the ball in play. Um, I, I do know I think most owners are worried about injury when you have pitchers hitting or running the bases. So I get it. You know, you, you want the safety of the players and you want to put the best product out there. Um, and uh, I'm sure there's a lot of DHs out there that uh, uh, are, are what really wanting to see this thing come into the National League. So, I mean, I think for our team here in Philadelphia, the DH would probably be a good thing because we have several candidates that would that don't play very good defense but can hit the <laughs> baseball. You know, Hoskins, you know, we can throw Harper in there to give him a break from playing in the field. Um, Alec Bohm, who has really struggled at third base, can now be put in the DH. We could DH Rio Muto when he needs a day off from catching. So that bringing the DH for us here in Philadelphia would probably be a good thing for us. Yeah, I think the thing, the problem with the whole, the way we got here is like, like we basically have to at this point, and it's because at every developmental level now we have a DH. So these guys, a lot of them, typically when they're let's, they're playing on their 12-year-old team, the guys who are going to go pro, they're probably the best pitcher on their team, and they're also probably the best hitter on their team. Right. And now things have gotten so specialized. And it's been, you know, change, it's changed over the years. It's been probably for 30 years we've had DHs in high school, maybe even longer than that. And so at a certain point, and now granted in high school, there are guys who pitch and they play a position on their off days. But once they get drafted, once they go to college, most of them are specialized and they're right. either a pitcher and they don't hit anymore. We take the bat out of their hands. They don't bat in minor leagues. They don't bat in college. And so then when they get to the show, they're not polished at all. They can't hit. And right. if right. we hadn't done that, then pitchers would be hitting better. And then we'd probably have a little more room for guys to be like a Shohei Otani type player. Now we'll see what happens in the future. Maybe there are some guys who pitch in the minors and the DH on their off days. But I think the fact of the matter is we got to this point and now there's nothing we can do about it. So we kind of have to do what we have to do. Yeah. Yeah. I agree with you there. And, and also when, you know, there's so much interleague play now, you know, yeah. it used to be just had interleague within your division and now there's just I swear there's an interleague game every day. And, you know, it's a disadvantage for those American league teams when they come to the national league, because you have a, big time DH that can pop the ball to the ballpark and you come to a National League ballpark and, and he probably doesn't play. So you're losing this big bat out of your lineup and you got to throw a pitcher in that lineup that hasn't even picked up a bat all year. So, you know, somewhere we got to, we got to get it on a even playing field, I think. Yeah. So I will enjoy our final today could be our final National League game ever as we know it. And uh, I'll enjoy it for what it is. We got a few more days of this potentially, um, but then we're moving on to a new era. Now you played in the playoffs twice, I believe, right? 93 yeah. and 98. Yep. What yep. was the difference that you felt when you played in a playoff game versus a regular season game? Uh, the energy, um, the excitement, uh, the importance of each pitch, each play. Uh, it's magnified, you know, tremendously when you're in the playoff game because, you know, you're, you are you know, you can get eliminated real quick uh, in the playoffs. But the, the, the energy of the fans was unbelievable. I mean, here in Philadelphia in 93, we had 55,000 people at that stadium. Just it was the loudest ballpark I've ever been in. Um, it's just there. It's a lot more intense. It really is. And, you know, you know, there's there's things on the line here and. You know, you played 162 games to get to that point, and then, um, you know, you're playing in front of national television, in front of millions of people. Um, media is, you know, it goes from, you know, 50 media people to a couple hundred media people, and um, it's just really magnified. And like I said, every pitch, every strike, every play is just magnified tenfold. So it's, it's, it's just a lot more intense for sure. Now, 1993, you guys go to the World Series, and really it was a, an outlier year for the Phillies in the 90s because I believe that was the only year that the Phillies had a winning record yeah, for that matter. <laughs> 90, <laughs> 97 yeah. wins, NL West champions. And by the way, I 
you know, again, the I think wild card came in in 94 or 95. Was it 95 after the strike? Uh, when did wild card come in? Um, Let's see. We played Atlanta. So what? It was yeah, my, yeah. It might have came in right after that. Ninety. It was actually ninety four. Ninety four. Yeah, it came in right after that. Well, ninety four was a strike year, and then so maybe ninety five is when it officially came in. But uh, yeah, ninety three we played the Braves, and um, I don't even I don't even remember. Like, you know, Blue Jays played Oakland or somebody. I think it was back. So um, yeah, wild card came in right after that. Why on earth were the Phillies in the NL West? <laughs> um, I don't even. That's so far back. <laughs> I'm trying to think of. I don't know how that played out, to be honest with you, because we were battling. We were battling the um, Expos uh, down to the wire there. So I don't know. I don't even remember what the the divisions were back in. in when when I played, to be honest, I know the Mets. We had the oh, Mets. Oh, sorry, I go, I goofed it up. You guys were in the NL East. Braves yeah, we were in the, in the East. But yeah. there were. But I think there were only two. weren't there only two? Yeah. Two divisions then. Right. So it was the East and the West. I think it was. So. Yeah. So no, but I guess so. I mixed y'all up with the Braves, but again, why are the Braves playing in the NL yeah, West? Like, yeah, I don't know why the, they had the Braves out in the West. To be honest with you, it was it was a little screwed up back then. But, um, you know, they were the Braves were the the team. Obviously, they went to fifteen. I think fifteen straight playoffs, and you know they had three Hall of Fame starting pitchers and a couple of Hall of Fame players. They were, you know, we had we had no shot at beating the Braves according to anybody. And uh, we shocked the world uh, when we did that. That's for sure. Were the Braves the team of the nineties? Was it the Braves or the Yankees? Uh, I don't know how many t- titles. I mean, the Braves, they were so good, but they only won one, yeah. one championship. They never could, uh, you know, win a championship except I think in 90, what year did they win it? 90, 91 or 92 yeah, 91 or 92 so i don't know how many of the yankees won during the 90s but when you go to the playoffs 15 straight years you, you got to be considered the team of the decade that's for sure well i they had a little bit of like an america's team type thing that the dallas cowboys right. had because a lot of people who are in their 30s or 40s now that was a team that they were a big fan of the Braves because they were on TBS every single right. night. You could watch right. their games. They were the only team in the South. Um, and they were generally likable bunch, maybe not for Phillies. Maybe you guys didn't like them very much. Right. Yeah. We didn't like them, <laughs> but yeah, there were two teams the Braves and the Cubs because the Cubs were on WGN and mm-hmm. they were pretty, and they were awful aside yeah, from, yeah. aside from 98, of course. Right. And they were pretty national too, but yeah, the, the Braves were on TBS. Everybody watched them. Ted Turner, you know, had his thing going down there with Jane Fonda. They were always sitting in the front row down there, but um, you know, they did it right. They, they built that uh, team up through the farm system and then they went out and got the Maddoxes and, and those types of players, Fred McGriff, Pendleton, they brought in quality players. And they, they were stacked. I mean, they were, they were good from top to bottom. So a lot of you, you faced them in that 93 uh, league championship series. And then of course you also had several battles once you guys went in the same division between Greg Maddox, Tom Glavin, John Smoltz, which guy did you fear facing the most? I didn't fear any of the Braves pitchers. I was actually, the Braves were probably the, team I hit the best um, Ooh. my numbers off Maddox I hit about 340 I hit about 320 off Smoltz I was right around 300 off Glavin I actually and I, I know nobody knows this but at old Turner Field there in Atlanta I have the best uh batting average for any road player in that field um wow which, which is pretty amazing if you think yeah. about it but uh for some reason, there's certain pitching staffs I hit well and other pitching staffs I didn't. The Braves were one staff I really hit very well. So that 93 team, you guys, again, outlier season, 97 wins. The rest of the years in that, uh, in the 90s, the Phillies really struggled. What was different about that year? How, why did it all click? 
Yeah. Um, well, 92, we came in last. We were awful. We didn't have a lot of talent. But our uh, general manager, Lee Thomas, did a great job. He went out and got some really good veteran players, not superstars, but guys that really knew how to play the game. Milt Thompson, Peter Cavilia, Jim Eisenreich, Danny Jackson. We brought in all these veteran players that still had a lot of years left in, in, in baseball. And the big thing was, I think, we got off to a really hot start. We were eight and one out of the gate. And now the fans are starting to take notice. Now we're starting to get 40,000 fans at Vet Stadium and we're playing in front of these big crowds. And the other thing is, I think you have to have some players that have career years. And Kurt Schilling had a career year. Ben Rivera had a career year. Tommy Green had a career year. Dalton, Dykstra, those types of guys, they all had career years. And, and just uh, the confidence that we had from that that quick start just kind of kept carrying over and carrying over. And all of a sudden we get to June and we're in first place. We get to July, we're still in first place. And and then we started riding the 50,000 fans at Fed Stadium and um, never looked back. So any similarities you feel like between your Phillies team and this year's San Francisco Giants, where it's just like everybody was having a career year and outperforming? That's an absolutely good uh, – yeah, that's that's – Pretty much us to a T because they had a lot of veteran players that had really bad years the last couple of years. Posey and Gosman and those types of guys. Um, Crawford surely wasn't having the year that he had this year. Those guys all came out and, and, and then like, like, like we did, they got off to a super hot start. Um, and then I'm sure they were riding big crowds out there, you know, in San Francisco. And um, that was really a truly amazing story because I did not see that coming. Um, um, I hate to give Gabe credit, but he did a great <laughs> job out there with that team. And, you know, to win a hundred, what they win 107 games. That's, that's, and they were. Um, so, um, yeah, th it was unfortunate that those two had to play in the first series. Yeah. Um, you know, you had the two best teams going at it early. That was kind of unfortunate, but, uh, um, yeah, the, the, the similarities there are, are pretty close. While we're talking about the 93 team, I got a, a question from a listener by the name of Paul Young, and he wanted to know, what was it like playing with John Crook? <laughs> it was fun. John's, uh, he's, you know, he's a very um, funny guy, but uh, very knowledgeable baseball player, very athletic. You wouldn't think of him as very athletic, but he was a very athletic player, had a lot of fun, but uh, um he was a great teammate. He was a great teammate. Um, I enjoyed every, I think I played with John for probably three or four years and um, just a pleasure to be around. Loved baseball, loved playing baseball, kind of dirty, gritty kind of player. And, um, you know, he was, uh, he was one of those guys you look at him and, and you say, man, he, he's not, he can't be very good at baseball, but uh, he was really <laughs> good and uh, he could hit. Um, he was pretty good around the bag had a little bit of speed for, you know, you wouldn't think he did, but he had a little bit of speed. And um, like I said, he was a great teammate. Yeah. I was watching yesterday. I watched the uh, whatever it takes, dude. It was 93. I think it was VHS tape. Someone put it on yeah. YouTube. I was yeah. watching that. And uh, they were saying, I can't remember who said it. It was probably Lenny Dykstra. And he's like, John Cruck is a hero to every beer league softball player. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> and, uh, you know, I'd come into the ballpark. I usually got there about 1 o'clock in the afternoon for a night game. And, I, you know, there's a routine that I had. And, you know, Crucky would be in the, the, our eating area with a couple of, you know, 12-inch pizzas, you know, and a, and a Pepsi or something. Not, <laughs> not your most nutrition uh, food uh, before a game. But, uh, you know, he'd eat French fries and all that greasy stuff. But uh, it worked for him. <laughs> yeah, Jason Giambi used to hear I, I heard that he used to eat Big Macs on his way to the ballpark every day. Yeah, it's changed a lot since when we played. We weren't real consumed with eating healthy and doing all that kind of stuff. Like not like they are today. I mean, they have chefs in every clubhouse now cooking healthy foods and eating right. And uh, that's not that's not something the ninety-three Phillies did very well, that's for sure. All right. Another question about ninety-three Phillies teammate. Kurt Schilling, why isn't he in the Hall of Fame? <laughs> I got to be careful here what I say. Yes. Um, yeah. 
you know, he's been really outspoken. I mean, I think that's the main reason. He's really been really outspoken in certain areas that um, where he probably shouldn't be, and I think it's cost him some votes. And he's right there on the on the tip of um, getting in, but now he comes out and says, you know, he, he said a bunch of stuff about the voters that they don't know oh. what they're doing, and uh, that's probably not the right route to go when you're that close. So I think that's the only thing that's keeping him from getting in. You know, is is his in-season, regular season numbers are, you know, they're okay. They're borderline Hall of Fame, but his playoff numbers are off the charts. Um, that's what probably really, if he does get in, will get him in was his, um, you know, the way he pitched in the in the playoffs. I mean, he was unbelievable. I, I mean, I think if, if I had to pick one pitcher in a game seven of a playoff game, um, he's going to be the guy I pick. Uh, that's how dominant he was in big games. So um, if he would just uh, kind of go away and let the voters <laughs> vote and, you know, let them do their thing, I think he'd get in. Yeah, I think it's a little interesting, and we won't get it too deep into any of that stuff. But, you know, a lot of the writers have said, like, oh, well, he's got character issues. But mm -hmm. it really seemed like everybody who played with him liked him. It doesn't seem like he had any... I guess I, you could speak to what it was like playing with him, but it, it seemed like he was well liked, and that I don't remember people talking about that until after his career ended. Yeah, I mean, he was he was a very he he was a very focused pitcher. Nobody um, prepared better than Kurt did. I mean, he prepared for every start. He knew every pitch he wanted to throw, every batter. He really looked at video and and came up with a game plan for every hitter. Uh, he was very good at that, and. Uh, he had great command. He knew where he wanted to throw the ball, and, and rarely did he miss his spot. Um, he threw hard. He had a great split finger, um, and he wasn't afraid of anybody. He, he, you know, he faced some of the best hitters of all time and uh, challenged them. And uh, I had no problem with Kerr as a teammate. Um, like I said, he, you know, he was focused and he wanted to go out there and succeed and pitch well and help his team win. Yeah, so then, of course, 94 happens, and, you know, it was a shortened season. You guys didn't have a winning record when the season stopped, but there was. do you think that that stoppage and having that strike and everything, do you feel like that may have put a damper on the window of competition for the Phillies? Uh, no, I think more it was injuries that really hammered us. Dalton started to get hurt a little bit more. Dykstra seemed to be always hurt. You know, Crucky was starting to get up there in age. Um, we did have a veteran team. Danny Jackson was was getting up there in age. And um, so I don't think it was the strike so much. It just we couldn't stay healthy with our, our, our big players. Um, we actually started off 94 pretty good, if I remember correctly. And then the injuries hit, I think, Dalton and Dykstra got hurt and a couple of Schilling had arm issues at that point, I think. And uh, things kind of went south from there. But, uh, you know, like I said, 93 was just one of those years where everything clicked. Everybody played well. We came together as a team. And, um, it, you know, I feel sorry for the Expos in 94 because they were dominating. I mean, they had a, a team that, that could match with anybody. And uh, they probably were going to go into the World Series and have a good chance to win. So I kind of – felt bad for all those guys up in Montreal because they had a really good team that year. Did that year, did the strike kill the Expos? If they go and they get to the World Series in 94, do, they, do you think they end up moving? <sighs> Probably not. Uh, you know, one of the loudest venues we ever played in was in Montreal in 93 because they were right on the, our heels and we went up there late for a series and that place was jam-packed and, I mean, it was loud. So, um, yeah, I think 94 did kill them. I mean, they were, they, I'm telling you, they were on the path to, to win a World Series that year. And it had to be extremely disappointing for everybody up there, including the players. And um, 95 comes out and they just weren't the same team. But, um, yeah, that, 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 that's, that's tough when you're that good of a team and you don't even get a chance to uh, get to the playoffs because of a strike. Now, obviously, I've heard about the strike. Um but I didn't live through it because that was the year I was born. I, and there was no World Series champion the year that I was born. Um, so I'm curious in terms of I've heard a lot about the strike over the years. Do you feel that the strike um, hurt the sports popularity? And then, of course, we had some great storylines. 
a few years after the strike that maybe brought it back up. Yeah, it killed our sport. Absolutely killed it. Um, the fans were not happy at all that uh, we ended that season without a World Series. And we lost a tremendous amount of fans. And it literally took 95, 96, 97, and it took the home run battle in 98 between Sosa and McGuire to start getting fans back to where they were pre-strike. And uh, it took a long time. There were a lot of fans out there that were very hurt by what had taken place. And thank goodness that uh, Mr. McGuire and Mr. Sosa um, had that home run battle because that really was the start of the fans really starting to come back and take notice and really have some, um, uh, you know, confidence that we knew what we were doing as players and owners and that we were doing, you know, things the right way to help the game. We'll talk 98 season in a second, but I'm curious, do you feel like Cal Ripken Jr. streak also helped in that regard? Oh, no question. Um, anytime you're doing something – um, like that, where you're setting records, and, and Cal Streep was unbelievable. To play that many games in a row uh, was amazing. And, yeah, all those things combined, and we had some good races that year and a lot of good things going on. You know, the Cubs were finally winning, and um, obviously the Braves were still the Braves, you know, um, and the Blue Jays were always good back then. So we had a lot of good things happen, and obviously the Cal Streep uh, was just one, one other thing that uh, – baseball needed at that time so 1998 you come over to the cubs what what uh sold you on the city of chicago at the time well we actually lived in valparaiso me and my wife and at that time uh jordan and griffin were born so jordan would have been four-ish and griff would have been like almost two or going on two um so we loved the city of chicago before i even got traded there um it's a great city obviously you know the food's great they're on the water there that my wife has always said it's the best shopping place uh, in, in the country but um uh we love chicago and if we were going to get traded anywhere to get traded chicago was perfect for us because mm. now i'm only an hour i live an hour from wrigley field um i can commute back and forth the kids can live in their own house during the summer um, so it was a perfect trade for me and it worked out great. I came over and played really well for the Cubs. Doug Lanville went to the Phillies and played really well there. So, um, both teams really won, uh, on that trade front. Yeah. So 90, 98, do you feel that was your best professional personal season? Absolutely. I had career numbers in like six or seven different categories, batting average, home runs, RBIs, walks, runs scored. Uh, I think my fielding percentage was like 992 or something there. So, yeah, it was by far uh, overall, um, yeah, my best year. And I, and I really attribute it to I got uh, – I was fortunate I got to hit in front of Mark Grace and Sammy Sosa all year. So, you know, a lot of pitchers challenged me because they wanted to get me off – keep me off the base so they didn't have to face those big boppers behind me with guys on base. And – uh, I was always a good fastball hitter, and I took advantage of it that year. 1998, you're playing second base. Kerry Wood strikes out 20. I believe that was 98, right? That was yeah. 98? Yeah. Nope. At what point in that game did you feel that there was something really special going on? Probably like the second inning. I mean, his fast – he always had an unbelievable fastball, um, and the breaking ball that day was off the charts. It's the best breaking ball I've seen any individual pitcher have in any game that I played in. Um, but what he had that day that he hadn't had in the past was command. He was commanding the baseball. He was throwing it wherever he wanted. And he went up and down an Astros lineup that was pretty darn good um, and made them all look pretty silly. And uh, he was he was extra special that day. What was it like having a front row seat? Your teammates with Sammy Sosa in 98 and then, of course, in 99. But 98 was the big time summer. They're ch the home run chase. Uh, and McGuire, of course, you play the Cardinals uh, several times that season. How was it having a front row seat for that whole thing? What made it great was not only if Sammy was unbelievable that year, but we were in the playoff hunt. So yeah. the games meant something. It wasn't just Sammy going out and hitting home runs. The games actually meant something. And we're trying to win baseball games. And, um, you know, Sammy hits the 20 home runs in June, which is remarkable. 
And then, you know, August comes and then him and him and McGuire just kept going back and forth, back and forth. And all the baseball uh, ballparks started to have a, a McGuire Sosa count up on their scoreboards. And even in the middle of the game, you know, you'd see McGuire's number go from, you know, 51 to 52. And then Sammy come up and hit one and you'd see his number change. And they've those two guys were remarkable that year. And, um, you know, they were neck and neck until the last, you know, seven or eight days. And then McGuire kind of took off that last week. But everybody kind of forgets that Ken Griffey Jr., I believe, led both leagues in home runs at the All-Star break. He had like 39 at the All-Star break or something. So he almost could have been in that mix too. But he kind of tailed off in the second half. But uh, – uh, it was fun to watch. It was great to be a part of. And, and like I said, being at the Cubs were good that year. It really even added more to the mix. Yeah, I think Greg Vaughn was up there on that numbers too. Yeah, I don't remember Greg, but yeah, I mean, obviously it was the steroid era and a lot of guys were hitting a lot of home runs. But uh, um, yeah, it was, it was truly remarkable. And I was actually on the field when McGuire broke the record. Uh, oh, we wow. Were, we were playing the Cubs. We were playing the Cardinals that day. Uh, he hit it off of Steve Traxel. So um, even though it was against us, that was uh, pretty exciting to watch. Did they pause? They paused the game for that, right? They did because the um, uh, Garrett, or yeah, the Roger Maris family was there, the kids and all the grandkids and stuff. So, <laughs> so uh, yeah, they paused the game and McGuire went over and gave his respects to the Maris family. And, you know, Sammy came in and they did their thing. And, uh, yeah, um, I know our pitcher, Steve Traxel, wasn't happy about it, you know, but, uh, you know, when you have something that monumental happen during the game, you got to, you know, pause and take a moment and enjoy it. Yeah, and you mentioned the steroid era, and of course, Sosa, McGuire, and then a bunch of other names, stars from that era, linked to PED usage. Now, for the longest time, I've always felt like, yeah, I don't, oh, we lost you for a sec here. Well, uh, oh, good. You're back. There you go. Yeah. So, of course, you know, there are a lot of guys from that era who were stars linked to PEDs. For the longest time, I've had this opinion of, like, if I were to vote and I if I get a vote for the Hall of Fame someday, my thing would be I don't really like how much power the writers have. I want the Hall of Fame to re reflect a little more of a balance of what the players feel. Right. So I'm curious. And I've heard – players say different things what are your thoughts about guys who such as those guys who are linked to peds should they be in the hall of fame i think so i really do i mean barry bonds is the best player i ever played against hands down there's nobody even close and um uh, you know i he was good before uh he started you know with the steroid he was just a remarkable player and i mean roger clemens he's got seven cy youngs um, those types of guys, I, I think they deserve to be in. Um, but I'm probably in the minority there. But, uh, you know, I played with all those guys or against all those guys. And there were some some pretty, pretty darn good baseball players that, uh, you know, are the best I've ever seen play. So I, I think they should be in. I really do. If I ever get a vote, the way I'm going to run it is like investigative journalism. I think what a lot of these writers do is they just kind of look at the numbers and some of them didn't even live through it. And they just say, they make their decisions. I'd like to see it more like an investigative journalism piece. Talk to as many former players as possible, get their thoughts. And who are the guys that who like, like for instance, Jeff Kent, one of the best hitting second baseman right. who's ever, there's ever been 400 home runs, MVP, He's been kept out of the Hall of Fame. There are a number of guys who I think are underrated who haven't been considered for the Hall of Fame. Are there any guys that you feel we haven't who haven't gotten in aside from the PED guys that we should have more of a conversation about? Well, there's one guy, and he was my favorite ball player growing up. His name was Al Oliver. Uh, had about 2,800 big league hits, and, and obviously I didn't play with him or against him. I watched him growing up, but every big leader I talked to that had to face Al Oliver at the plate said he was one of the best hitters ever to play the game. And um, so there's a lot of guys out there like that. And I'm with you. I, I don't know why it's strictly writers that, that uh, um, vote these guys in or not. Now, obviously it goes to other committees um, if they don't get in veterans committee and things like that. But I'm with you. I think we should have a couple of writers, a couple of ex ball players, 
um, I don't know, maybe a couple of ex general managers or things like that, and not have so many where we have like 150 guys vote, maybe keep it to, you know, 20, 25 guys that really know they don't have a bias against anybody. They just look at the numbers and look at the performance and did they have a, a huge impact in their era? And let's do it that way. But uh, I don't know if it'll ever get to that. Yeah, I mean, if that's how we do things, I think Kurt Schilling would be in the Hall of Fame by now. I would think so. Um, who knows? I, I, you know, right? Um, I, I don't know. I don't know how ex ball players would vote. Um, yeah. You know, there. I guess you're probably always going to have some sort of bias, no matter who's voting. Um, but um, you know, I, to have 150. Um, I don't even know how you qualify to be a, a Hall of Fame voter. I don't know if you have to write for so many years or you have to get asked to come in. I don't know how that works, but I'm sure there's a lot of bias as far as these uh, reporters are concerned when, when voting for these guys. So you played for the Indiana Hoosiers back in the 1980s. And, of course, they had an excellent basketball program at the yeah. time. Did you enjoy your time at Bloomington? Oh, yeah. Loved it. I loved Bloomington. Uh, I actually just went back. We have a IU baseball reunion once a year. So I just went back in early October and um, met up with a bunch of the guys I used to play with. And we had a little golf tournament and, uh, you know, had sat down and had a few few drinks, few cocktails, reminisce about the good old days. But I loved my time there. And, yeah, the basketball was tremendous back then. I was actually there in 87 when we won the national championship so that was a blast Steve that, Alford right Alford and uh, Keith Smart hit the game winning shot and uh, it was a really good balanced team and um, I'm just hoping we can get back to that as far as basketball <laughs> our basketball has not been good for a number of years we've always been kind of middle of the row and uh, barely making the turn tournament even if we do so hopefully uh, Mike Woods can come in and turn this program around start getting some better recruits, local recruits. We seem to be missing out on a lot of the local talent nowadays, in which we used to get very easily back in the day. So hopefully we can uh, turn this thing around and get back to um, being a top 10 team here sometime soon. You like the Mike Woodson hire? Yeah, I think they wanted to hire from someone that, that was, you know, had a connection with Indiana. It seems like the last – you know, 10 or 15 years, we brought outside people in. So they wanted to get someone that had a connection to the university. And he obviously was a big part um, of the university back in probably the late 70s, early 80s, or whatever it was. So, yeah, I think I like the hire. He's, you know, he was an NBA coach for a number of years, assistant coach. So I'm hoping uh, it's all going to come down to recruiting. And I think, I think uh, more people are going to be apt to go there with his experience and knowledge of the game. Yeah, I like it too. I think they'll do well. We're only a couple weeks out from college hoop season, believe it or not. Yeah. Yeah. Now, when you played at Indiana, was Joe Girardi playing at Northwestern at the time? You know, I think he was. I, I we didn't we had divisions back then. So there was five uh, in our division and five in the other division, and Northwestern was in the other division. So we didn't play them. But I think Joe might have been a senior when I was a. Uh, maybe a sophomore maybe, but we didn't get a chance to play him. But, uh, yeah, he was uh, – there's some, some pretty big names that came out of the Big Ten, that's for sure. Yeah, who else was in the Big Ten at that time? Well, I was – we played Michigan. We, we had Michigan, Michigan State, Ohio State, us, and Purdue, I believe, were the five. Um, I played against Jim Abbott. Um, I played against – I think uh, – uh, Chris Sabo was, was a senior when I was a freshman. Um, Barry Larkin was a, was there. Um, Michigan was stacked when I was a freshman. They had a boatload of good players. Um, but, uh, yeah, I mean, uh, Purdue always had a couple of – Archie C. and Franco, I don't know if you remember him. He wasn't a big-time player in the, in the big leagues. But uh, um, Big Ten baseball has gotten – really good i mean indiana is really good in baseball now they built a brand new ballpark turf ballpark a number of years back and uh they're drawing big crowds there now and so big 10 baseball's come a long way since uh, the years i was there so i went to this was about four years ago i was in bloomington and i went to buffaloes and you know they brought they had a buffaloes in valpo you remember buffaloes yeah oh sure 
Yeah. So Buffalo is cool spot wing place. Uh, they got a lot of IU gear decked out to, re- uh, to decorate the place. And I saw there was a Kyle Schwarber Jersey up on yeah. the wall and the store owner was walking around. Great guy. And he, he met me and we're talking. And I was like, I see you got, I see you got a Kyle Schwarber Jersey here. Do you have a Mickey Morandini Jersey? And he says, I wish I did. Oh, really? Yeah. He's like, no, I don't. He's like, he's like, you must be a Valpo guy. Are you a Valpo guy? All right. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, I, I'll give him a jersey if he wants a jersey. They actually at the university had asked me for my Olympic jersey. So I think it's hanging somewhere in Assembly Hall, actually. So that was pretty cool. Um, but uh, yeah, that's cool. I mean, I still hold some records there at IU. Um, the difference between, you know, when I played and, and, and the games now is we did, we had an unlimited number of games. We could play as many games as we wanted to. Now they, they've limited games and practices and things like that. But, uh, yeah, I thoroughly enjoyed my time at IU. It was, it, was, it was fun. I actually met my wife at IU, so I can't complain. Hey, that's a great story right there. And then, of course, you got to – you passed on the draft in 1987, I believe it was, so you could play in the Olympics in 1988. Uh, South Korea, right? Yes. How was that experience? Yeah, I uh, I had a tough choice because the Pirates drafted me in 87, and I'm from Pittsburgh, so I grew up a huge Pirates fan. So to get drafted by your – you know, the team you followed for a number of years and to have to turn them down was a tough decision for me. But I did. I had the opportunity to play on the Olympic team the following year. I knew I was going to get an invite to the Olympics. And that's just something I couldn't pass up to be able to, you know, you get a once in a lifetime chance to play for your country. Uh, you got to take it. And uh, I was fortunate enough to make the team. And we went on in 88, Seoul, Korea, and won the gold medal. Sweet. And did you get to, you were probably bonding with all the other athletes there, some of the basketball guys? and I Yeah, I mean, we didn't hang out with them, but the, you know where I met them the most was the uh, uh, pre-Olympic ceremonies. Um, you know, I got some picture taken. I think it was David Robinson and J.R. Reed. And here's this little Mickey Morandini and, you know, <laughs> two huge uh, basketball players. I looked like I was about five years old, but I got a picture taken with Chris Everett. And um, so that was kind of cool to, to mingle with all those great athletes in the, in the opening ceremonies. That was fun. And finally, uh, another question I have from a listener, Derek Young wants to know, he's a big time Phillies fan. How's it feel to be a Phillies fan favorite still after all these years? <laughs> uh, it's fun. It is, uh, you know, Harry, Harry the K kind of put me on the map with the way he said my name. So anytime I go out in the community, everybody says my name, like Harry Callis used to say it. But, uh, you know, it, it, it's it's weird at times because, you know, I just – I'm not a superstar by any means. I just came in here and I had, you know, you know, eight or nine good years here. And But I, I think what the fans most respect is I went out, I played the game hard, I played the game the right way, um, you know, did the – did things the right way. I always had a good relationship with the media, with the fans, with the coaching staff, people in the front office. And uh, really it's enabled me to continue to work for the Phillies. I'm still working for the Phillies as their ambassador now. And, um, but I love the Philly fans. They, they, uh, it's great to mingle with them. I do a lot of things out in the community and things at the ballpark. And it's always great to sit down and chat with fans that kind of grew up uh, watching you play and rooting for you. That's awesome. Well, Mick, this was a, a lot of fun having you on. Is there anything else you'd like to add? Anything you'd like to promote while you're here? No, I don't think so. I mean, as far as the Phillies are concerned, we got a lot of work to do next year. I mean, we need a closer. We need a, an outfielder, a couple of relievers. We yeah, need... what do you think? What are they going to do this offseason? Yeah, you know, they're a little bit down on Didi. Um, so they're talking about going out and there's four uh, shortstops, big time shortstops that are free agents. So they're kind of throwing around possibly the idea of signing one of them. Um, and uh, we need an outfielder for sure. We need kind of a big bat to protect Harper. Chris Bryant? Uh, yeah, if, he, if, if they want to pay him, you know. Yeah, you know, right. We, you know, we're already paying Harper 25 a year and, and Wheeler, you know, 20-something a year and Rio Muto 20-something a year. So we're a little bit restricted uh, payroll-wise, but uh, – 
we need a closer for sure. We blew 34 saves last year. And if you think about it, we lost the division. You know, we came into the last series of the year, you know, battling the Braves for a division title. So when you blow 34 saves, you know, if you win five or six of those games, you're in the playoffs. So we need a closer. Um, and like I said, we need a big bopper in the middle of that lineup. So we'll see where they go. Um, we do have a little bit of payroll coming off with McCutcheon and Herrera and a couple of the relievers. So we'll see what happens. But I know Dave Dombrowski is a go-getter. He likes to go out and, 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 you know, make an impact, sign some big free agents. So hopefully he can get something done. Yeah, I mean, I think it would be great to get the Phillies back in the postseason. They've gone the longest of any yeah. National League team now because – now, granted, that's also skewed because they let everyone in the postseason a year ago except the Phillies. Right. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> but Yeah, uh, but it's now, been a while. We haven't been in the playoffs since 2011, so yeah. it's time. It's time uh, – you know, the Sixers are good right now, but – you know, they've had some setbacks here with Simmons and the Flyers two years ago went to the playoffs, but they had an off year. And the Eagles, are since they've won the Super Bowl, have not been good. So Philly's kind of uh, anxious for a, a, another championship here. So hopefully the Phillies can be that team to do it. I just love to see another Phillies Braves playoff series. That's what I want to see. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I, I agree with you. I would love to see that. And, you know, the Mets are our biggest rival by, you know, by far the Mets and the Phillies, but the Braves are right there too. And uh, it's going to be a good division next year. The Mets, you know, they're always supposed to be really good and they always have uh, things that uh, distract them. And um, Washington, you know, they sold off their big pieces. So they're kind of rebuilding Miami's kind of up and coming. So, um, it, it's not an easy division. It was down this year. Uh, you know, the teams, we were supposed to be really good. Three or four teams were supposed to be really good this year. And really nobody jumped out. But uh, uh, we'll see what happens. I'm looking forward to the offseason. Like I said, hopefully we can make a big splash and get back there next year. Well, Mick, thank you so much for coming on today. This is a lot of fun. Thanks, Jack. It's been a pleasure. All right, guys, that's it for today's show. Make sure you subscribe to the Jack Vita Show wherever it is that you get your podcasts. Follow me on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook at Jack Vita Show. We'll be back next week for our World Series preview and more football coverage as well. Until then, I'm Jack Vita. Bring in the dancing lobsters. <laughs>